Thank you so much to the BOCAS Lit Fest. Thank you to Nicholas um, for inviting me to be here. And it is really a tremendous honor for me to be um, taught, discussing uh, mothers, fathers, daughters, and sons with these wonderful writers. Um, in our discussion, we'll be looking at three books which navigate the complex complexities of family relationships and how they uh, are passed down and how they impact the generations that follow. So with me today, um, I have the pleasure of talking with, to my immediate right, Shivani Ramlachan. Shivani is a Trinidadian poet, critic, and book blogger. Her first book of poems, Everyone Knows I Am a Haunting, from People, uh, sorry, People Tree Press, was a finalist for the 2018 People's Choice TNT Book of the Year and was shortlisted for the Felix Dennis Forward Prize for Best First Collection. Shivani was shortlisted for the 2018 Bridport Prize for Poetry. The Red Thread Cycle from her debut collection won a small acts literary competition for poetry and was an audio visual display at the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas. So please join me in welcoming Shivani. Next to Shivani is Sophie J. Uh, Sophie is the author of Wildfires, uh, published by HarperCollins. Wildfires is the author's debut novel. It led to being a writer in residence and a visiting fellowship at the University of Oxford. Wildfires was also long listed for the 2019 Peggy Chapman Andrews Award for uh, first novel. Born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago, Jay splits her time between Toronto and London. So please join me in welcoming Sophie. Thank you. And last but not least, Anthony Joseph. Anthony Joseph is an award-winning Trinidadian-born poet, novelist, academic, and musician. He is the author of five poetry collections and three novels. His 2018 novel, Kitsch, a fictional biography of a Calypso icon, was shortlisted for the Republic of Consciousness Prize and the Royal Society of Literature's Encore Award. And it was long listed for the OCM BOCAS Prize for Caribbean Literature. In 2019, he was awarded the Gerald Compton Poetry Fellowship. Um, his most recent album, The Rich Are Only Defeated When Running For Their Lives, was released in May 2021. His latest poetry collection, Sonnets for Albert, is shortlisted for this year's Forward Prize for Best Collection and the T.S. Eliot Prize. He lectures in creative writing at King's College, London. Let's welcome Anthony Joseph. Um, so it's been really wonderful spending time with your books and I think I'd love to kick off this conversation by just talking about what it means to be the storyteller in your family. Um, all of your books touch on family narratives to some extent, to a, to a lesser or greater extent, and there seems to be a kind of onus in that responsibility. Um, I was just wondering, like, as you, you know, obviously for Sophie that's more fictionalized, but you, you're, draw, you're writing about uh, the complexities of family life. And I was just wondering, like, how you took up that mantle? Was it something that you took on willingly, easily? Um, was it an easy decision to think, I want to write about my family in this upfront way, or to write about families in such a bare way and just expose all the, the difficulties? So, yeah, that's a question for all of you. Yeah, um, well, I think, I'm not sure if I took it up willingly, but that, those are the words and stories that came out when I first started typing this novel out. And I wouldn't say that I am the storyteller of my family. Mm. My family is completely full of storytellers. And if anything, I'm, I'm the listener of the family. And I think now my family doesn't tell me as much stories, <laughs> um, even though it is fictionalized. Um, you know, once there's a rise in the family, everyone's a little bit more hesitant to share things. Mm. But um, yeah, I, I, I would say almost unwillingly, I took up this. Um, I wouldn't call it a burden completely, but this is what came out. And how has it been for you? How has it been for me? Yeah. With my family or? Just to write about families and yeah, yeah, I guess with your family. I've, I've always enjoyed reading family novels, family dynamics. I think your childhood home and your family that you grow up with in that home is the first world that you ever really encounter and it prepares you or doesn't prepare you for the world that you go into afterwards. Um, I think it's probably one of the only real worlds that we have, in, the only real world we encounter in our lives. Um, and it's the, our childhood and family homes, a lot of it stems from it. So for me, it was, it was a joy to write this book, even though it's largely about grief and death, betrayal, secrets. It was a complete joy to write this book about those things and to, of course, write about Trinidadian women. Mm. 
Yeah. Anthony? Um, I think for me, it's political as well as personal. So on a personal level, I realized, I realized many years ago that the more uh, personal you get in your work is the more universal the work becomes. So the more you tell your secrets, uh, it's the more universal the work spreads out a lot more. If you try to write something that is for everyone, it, can never, it never works. But if you write your deepest truths, uh, it touches a lot of people. So I've always sort of aspired towards doing that and to being really honest in the work, you know. So when I came to write about my dad, yeah, it was, everything had to come out, you know. Everything, all the honesty and all the truth about him, who he was, and, you know, my relationship with him in a very true and honest way. That was, that was what I wanted to do. But also as a Caribbean writer, and I think Sophie's hinting at this, that as a Caribbean writer, part of our responsibility is to be the historians for the people from the Caribbean. Part of it is to be the historian, the storytellers, uh, the, people, the people that collect the stories, because so much is lost. So much has been taken from us and so much is lost. So the writers, the novelists, the poets, the musicians become the people that, the historians, we keep the history, you know? So that's part of my responsibility as well as a Caribbean writer. And I think writing about the life of a, what we call a typical Caribbean man, a Trinidadian man, is not the sort of thing that you encounter every day in, in British literature or in literature in general. So it's our responsibility to illuminate those lives, you know, I think, as part of my role, at least. Mm. Wonderful, Shivani. I'm working on a collection of essays right now. So a departure from poetry that explores Indo-Caribbean women's disobedience across generations, starting with my grandmothers, then my mother, and myself. And after I wrote Everyone Knows I'm a Haunting, to which I'll say I had immense familial support from my parents and my siblings, my mother asked me, almost with a a kind of hope that knows it will be defeated. So is your next book going to be happy? And the answer is no, I don't think so. But I feel great responsibility to these essays in a different way than I did to the poems because they're talking about not just my life. If it were just me, I would say anything, and I have done, but how to write about people who are both dead and both with us people with whom I love and have loving relationships and whom I love a little less, let's be honest. There are always people like that in your family. Um, holding the weight of that is a great privilege and it is also really damn heavy sometimes. And so I've been here in the UK for a few months just writing through it. And I don't know if Anthony and Sophie relate to this as writers who travel frequently, but there's been a way in which writing in this place has enabled me to write some of the most difficult things in the essays about my family and about love and disobedience and, and recklessness and drug use and all the rest of it. Mm. Oh, that's really great. Um, like one thing that I'm, I'm getting from all of you is that it's, it's a heavy responsibility, but it is a responsibility that you, you know, that you have found rewarding in some way. Um, and I think one thing that I notice about all of your books is that you're not just telling stories, but there's either a silence that you are shattering um, or an absence that you are filling up and inhabiting and, you know, re, um, remeasuring and, and, you know, reconsidering in new ways. Um, Sophie, in, in, um, in your book, Wildfires, you know, you have the central character of Chevy who doesn't talk and he is very much the focal point and this like gravitational point for the whole family. Um, in Anthony, there's poems like Flack and Hathaway where the father's absence is just absolutely palpable and Tobago family. And it's, there's not only the father's absence, but also the possibility of another, another family. Um, and then in Shivani, there's all of the, just for example, the abortionist daughter and granddaughter poems, you know, uh, rewriting and reclaiming stories which are not necessarily considered um, by, you know, by the dominant hegemonic mainstream to be, uh, to be acceptable and giving those people a voice. So I think, I think that's really wonderful. And I just love to know, like, you know, 
how you felt about addressing those absences and how you went about writing through them and addressing them. Um, Shivani? Damn. <laughs> what if I looked really focused at the two of them? <laughs> it would just fly over me. Uh, I spent a lot of time as a young person and a slightly less young person making myself palatable to people in Trinidadian society, which mostly happened to be people I feared, who mostly happened to be Indo-Caribbean men. I learned, it was never taught to me, I think I taught it to myself, unfortunately, how to make myself foldable, biddable, docile. Doesn't sound like me, does it? But that's what I did for, for a long time. And when I committed myself to this practice of writing poems and sharing them in public, which as we know is a different enterprise to being a private poet, I developed a manifesto, I suppose, that has served me very well, um, which is that the poems must never apologize for themselves and that they are always committed to uncovering the truth beneath the truth, which is to say, not that Columbus discovered the Caribbean in 1492, which of course he fucking didn't, but what if, if not for the truth of your poem, what would never be spoken at all? And I dedicate myself to exploring that. This landed me in hot water, and um, I don't care. Well, I, I guess I do care, but um, again, I'm incredibly supported by my immediate family, and I think that's been, we're speaking of families, really essential to how I make this work. And since I have that, I feel like I can do whatever the hell I want. Great, thank you. Uh, I think for a book that's about silence, there's an awful lot of words <laughs> about it. Um, for me, writing about the silence of this particular family, of course I drew from personal experiences, but for me it was absolutely terrifying mm. because that silence was sort of placed there for a reason. And by putting words on a page, you start to confront that silence of what is usually a blank page, a silence. So for me, it was terrifying, paralyzing, completely interrupting daily life, not being able to get anything done because I realized what I had done, even though fictionally I had broken a silence. And who this book mattered very much for me was, was my family. And they are also very, very supportive of me. They're very, very proud. But being a quiet person in my family and having written a book about family and about silence, it, it was almost like, oh, Sophie has some thoughts uh, <laughs> <laughs> about this quietness that none of us mm. ever speak about. Mm. So in that sense, very, very scary to see things on the page that necessarily didn't make it to the published process. Um, you know, there might be 20 or so words in the book that are true that only I know they're true, but it is an absolutely terrifying thing to see those things in front of you. And then even more to know that people are gonna see it and, you know, think things about you, et cetera. But much like Shivani, I didn't care. I, I did care, and then I didn't care afterwards. It's both at the same time. Mm. But it is completely liberating, so freeing, and then, then the, the world didn't end. I was okay mm. afterwards. Mm. <laughs> I, I made it out the other end. So, yeah. Great, more than okay, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, Anthony? Absences, yeah. My father wasn't around, but the fact that he wasn't around meant that he was more present mm. in a strange way. Mm. And Flacken Hadaway talks about that. He, his myth grew huge, you know. The mythology of him and the anticipation of him was so huge that I felt his presence even though he wasn't there. Um, so yeah, there's that aspect of, of silence and absence. And there's also the fact that, you know, uh, I'm writing about my dad, but you know, it's personal and I'm connecting with readers at the same time. And the, the way I think it works is that the reader brings their own experiences, their own experience of loss, their own experience of unconditional love, their own experience of parenthood. They bring that to the text and they're able to fill in the gaps. They're able to fill in the sort of the coefficient, the absence. Um, so I think that's, that's how absence works for me. Uh, of course, you know, I got to know my dad much later on in life, you know, um, and we got to spend time together, but he was still absent. Even though he was with me and we were talking, he was very, 
He was not aloof, but he was very hard to get close to emotionally, like a lot of Caribbean men, you know. And the book kind of examines that as well, that sort of absence, presence but absence, you know, physically present but emotionally mm -hmm. distant, emotionally absent. Mm -hmm. So there's different layers of absence that are working within this. Definitely. Yeah. Like with all of your books, I definitely get a sense of, you know, literal hauntings, um, but also, you know, figurative as well, like feeling the absence of people, um, feeling the presence of people, sorry, even when they are physically absent. And yeah, that... Um, the emotional absence was, yeah, it was very striking mm. in your book. I wonder if we could get a short reading mm. from your collection. Would be great. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm going to read probably just three sonnets. They're, they're short, so it shouldn't take that much time. Um, I'm going to read a piece called Jogi Road. Jogi Road is a road in Trinidad near Aranguez, near where I lived in Mont Lambert. People that are from Trinidad will be familiar with it. Um, but what happened when I came to write this poem, uh, thanks to the internet, I was able to research and figure out where certain things were, where certain streets were, things that I thought I'd gotten wrong. And this poem kind of speaks to that. And it's also the only memory I have of my father and mother together. And it's not a, it's not a great memory, but it's, it's, it's all I have. Jogi wrote, from life, from love in shame. The red sawmill on Jogi Road with cedar grain in its fibrous air, red. The old train tracks and the bridge where my mother's rage was bruising the dark. Her fingernails ripped at my father's shirt, his face. This is blood. The way he looks away, then down with open palms and resignation. But memory has a curious sting. The red sawmill was not on Jogi Road, but on Silver Mill. And in the savannah, there were five salmon trees which cried when cut, not six. My father held me over his shoulder that night. No, I was looking up from the road. What do I know? Of my, of my father's body. Not even a bottle of duty-free rum or a carton of the Maurier. This time I come with both hands swinging. Arriving first at the funeral home where you are already waiting in your pillow box, exuding a kind of warmth. You are my father's body, but I know so little of you. I know the soft weight of your hands on my shoulder at the airport. I know your rings. And I felt the muscle of your panic wrist once when we were far out at Maracas and the ocean almost overcame us. I have seen your gut grow into its own sonnet and your head grow gleaming and bald. But today, it is your chest I come to know. How rigid it is when I press upon the crisp sheen of your burial shirt to tread a rose through the eye of your lapel. And I find the pole-bearing weight of your life when we grip the casket's chrome to lift and carry you down to the hearse waiting in the bright yard. And uh, I'm going to do a piece that I, can, I think I can do here because it's, it's in Trinidadian Creole. And when I read it for um, sort of non-Trinidadian Creole speakers, I have to say that, uh, you know, I'm sorry if you don't understand or get anything. You know, when I read James Joyce or Keats, I, sometimes I don't know what they're talking about either, but I got I to gotta make sense of it. But here, I think a lot of people are going to understand what I'm, what I'm trying to, to say here. So Tina was my sister. And Martina and my father had a really good relationship. They were close, even though he wasn't her father. Um, but my mom, for some reason, gave all her children the name Joseph. I don't know. Uh, so Martina and my dad became really close, um, and this is what this poem is about, their relationship. Tina, hear this one. The big man surveyed a house. He said, okay, all you will have to break down to build back that kitchen. While they're building, them pillars could support the bedroom. You and your daughter could stay in there. The living room need new flooring. Tiantec not connecting electric until you fix that roof. The wiring faulty, fire. 
You're talking good money, material, cement, labor. But Tina, you can't live like this with termite in ruins. He had left quite Santa Cruz to go to Five Rivers to see what could be done for Tina and Trish. Tina, not Albert's daughter, but Baptist, no Baptist, and she have his last name. She dies two years after he does. Serpent didn't possess her womb, was stomach cancer. And two weeks after, the house she suffered to save fell down. And I'll just read one more. Actually, this features my, my mom and dad again. I have this really amazing photograph of, my, of them together on their wedding day, which you can't see, but trust me, it's there. Um, it's in the book. And uh, yeah, a gap in language. They are captured forever in monochrome on the leaning lawn of their wedding day in September 1966, before my grandmother dug up the ground to plant flowers. She sewed the dress my mother wore, but who sews a wedding dress, press a footing on a wasp waste machine? I am also in the image. I am a gap in language, silent until November. By then, they had already begun to drift apart. My father told me how 20 years later, my mother arrived at the board house he was building on squat land in Chagronas. He thought was to reminisce, but was to serve him divorce papers on a Sunday afternoon. I can imagine them together there, but only as myth, sitting in his unfinished house. I came to know them apart and I cannot bring them together in death. Thanks. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I really like that last poem, how you kind of uh, grapple with uh, limitations of language, that even poems, um, there are certain gulfs that language and poetry can't traverse. And um, I just wonder, were there other things that you wanted to write about but struggled to write about because perhaps they defied articulation or they were you know, beyond definition or, they, or you, maybe you just weren't ready or? Um, no, there, wasn't, there was nothing that, I, that I, I purposefully stayed away from. Mm. A lot of stuff I just, I, there was not a lot, you know, there was, there was just little fragments of my father. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I wrote a, a lot of poems that probably didn't end up in here because they weren't very good. but. Um, there was nothing that I stared away from. I just, I just couldn't remember everything, and I, you know, I had very little to draw on. Um, no, I mean, no, I don't think there's anything really. What happens now is that I remember things, and I'm like, oh, shit, I should have put that in a book. But it's too late, you know? And I think that's going to happen for the rest of my life. It's, you know, a, a book is only a beginning. It's not, you know, this is not the whole story, so, yeah. So how far do you think the, what your, that your book was about you memorializing your father, and how much was it about you processing your relationship with your father? Ooh. Um, mm, processing, I think it's the same thing. I think I'm processing my relationship with him, of course, trying to understand, trying to hold him in place, because he's in here. He, this is him. He, in life, he was very hard to hold on to. So I have him in a place that I could go to and other people could read about him. So there's that. Um, but I'm also processing my own life as a parent as well, you know, my own mortality. I mean, you know, when a parent dies, like both parents, both of my parents are, are gone. So it does make you question your mortality. And towards the end of the book, that comes in a little bit more, you know. So it's looking at life and death as well, you know, uh, and dealing with, you know, seeing my father's body was an interesting, interesting moment for me, really, you know life-affirming, life-changing. So mm. I write about that a bit, and yeah it's, yeah, it's processing my relationship with him, but processing myself as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, Sophie, you mentioned earlier that there were things you didn't feel like you could write about. You don't have to tell us, but just what was the process of... <laughs> um, like you said, that there were things that you, you left out. So what was the... What were kind of some of the uh, things, questions you were asking yourself, the things you were considering? Um, are they going to go in another book? Yes, 
Yeah, <laughs> probably. I, I don't know if it'll be a book, maybe a short story. I, I really don't know. But um, the reason I didn't put it into this book is um, it, it just didn't fit. It was just uh, this, this just kind of wanted to stick to one story, um, and it just f felt like maybe I was putting like talking about or writing about too many things at once for the sake of my own uh, therapeutic writing, and it just did not fit with the story. As much as I, it felt good to write it, it just, this was not the story for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, there's an essay that you wrote in um, Wasafiri where you, you were talking about the process of writing the book, and you mentioned that you read um, Gaston Beauchelard's The Poetics of Space, mm -hmm. and that was like an inspirational point for you. And you know, one thing that I, the one thing that's very clear in your book is that the the domestic space, the house in which all the family uh, family members gather, is very important. Um, and I was just wondering, like, do you think it could have worked in another space, or how how important was the space to this story? As in a space other than a house? Other that house specifically. Hmm. I think the house structure, quite literally, the structure of the house, really did define. It had a definitely an impact on how the family navigated around each other, but at the same time, the family navigated the house also around each other. Like mm -hmm. it, they were very much dependent on each other. The, I always think that I always treated the house as a character of its own, mm -hmm. and I um, drew out the house before I, you know, knew really the characters, and I knew the mysterious one would go here, the liar would go here, this X X and X. So. Um, I, but I, I do think that if the house was much bigger, much brighter, I, I do wonder how that would have an effect on the relationships. How would they talk or not talk about things? Mm -hmm. If the house was much smaller and there was, you know, eight to nine people in it, mm -hmm. how would how would that would they be more combustible or mm -hmm. would pe more people move out? So I think it would be a diff. Ugh, I don't know if it would be a different story, but things might happen in a slightly different way. But definitely, the structure had an effect on them. Mm, and they on it, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely make, yeah. makes sense. It's kind of like the idea when people say that an idea swells and contracts based on the amount of time you give it. So if you give a task 20 minutes, it will take 20 minutes. If you give it two hours, it will take two hours. Oh. You know what I mean? And I think yeah. that kind of applies to people, especially yeah. in what you're saying about how the way they fill it kind of defines the house and the house kind of defines them back. Yeah. So that's really yeah. striking. Um, can we have a reading from your novel? That'd be really Yes. Cool. So. In addition to betrayal and secrets, there's also a, a love story in, in my book. So I'm going to read a scathing letter from a woman to a man. Here is what I go write when I, what I really feel in plain English. I's not a poet. What I want to say is that it is a real rare thing to meet somebody and feel like you know them and they know you within only a few hours of the same day. I never had that feeling before in my life. Even though we only went out for that walk once, remember? It was getting dark and he was explaining to me the blues musicians you like. And when I tell you I never heard the blues, you were shocked. And we start to laugh. That walk home feel like a lifetime, a whole next life, in a good way, eh? It was only a few hours and I still can't forget. Less than a day self. It's a hard feeling to let go. I don't know how to explain it. It's a strange thing to fail to forget something you can't explain. But maybe that is your reason self I can't forget. And it does bother me. To this day, it does bother me. While it's obvious it bothered me, I write to you almost 16 years since we first met at the supermarket. I myself could explain every detail of your face like I only see you 20 minutes ago. So that is the first thing I want to say. The se second thing I want to say is, what I want to know and what I will never know is, and I go say it in plain, bullface English so you can't mistake what I say in, why it wasn't me. I'm not saying that as a question, I'm saying that as a fact. Why you walk with me in the sunset so? Why you ask me questions about my father like you care? Why you walk me home? Why you bring dandelions for me? You just bring dandelion and savannah flowers for everybody, so? It must be so. Because when I did come to your apartment after we didn't hear from you the first time, when you had gone and run, when, you was, when my sister was pregnant with your second child, 
Your landlords did tell me you went to Caracas, where you had sons. Sons? I did nearly swallow my whole tongue right there. You had children and you didn't tell nobody? Look, I write down my question and answer it myself. You pick plenty flowers in your life. Don't get mad. Don't stop reading. I say nice things about you at the start. It's not like I hate you. I try to hate you. I mad at you and everything for the rest of my life. But I don't hate you. I try so long to understand why you was the way that you was. I try to say to myself, maybe he had a bad upbringing. Maybe he parents was a nice to he. Maybe something real bad happened to him, like it happened to me. And that is just how we turn out. He just bouncing from here to there, here to there. Not really thinking or feeling, but just moving, moving. Always moving so he don't have to sit still. I just think, what it is about sitting still that has scared this man? Why he always needs to run? Why he needs to lie so? But I get tired. There was just circles I running in my head, and eventually it stopped looking like one big zero. I sorry to say. Maybe bad things did happen to you, but that is no excuse for what you do. You's connected to my nephews, to my sister, to me. We's not strangers, you know. We's family now. I know I say it's not my place to say these things, but the things you do, you do it to all of we. It's only as I write and I feel the rage boil up in me so. I say nice things, okay, but you wasn't a nice person in the end. Sometimes you, sometimes you was, but look at the end. Look how it end. You leave we so. But we're getting on. We're getting on and that is good enough. But you absolve yourself of responsibility. You slap your hands clean from me like we was dust. And for that, you must live in shame forever. If not by your own recognition, then by we own. Go on and take a long, hard look in your mirror. Not that you need a mirror to see yourself. A guilty conscience don't need any accuser. I rather really hope that if you decide to look at yourself, and it's never too late, he's never too old, if you decide to look at yourself, you must see yourself and forgive yourself so that a better man is born from the shedding. I did see him once. Thanks. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I love that letter. It does such a great job of evoking the pain of loving someone who is not there. And, you know, the, the, and Rani, she kind of lives her life, um, you know, in love with someone who, <laughs> who isn't within her reach. Um, and, yeah, that really captures it in a, in a mm. very moving way. Um, and it also, this idea of the object of one's affection being absent, um, it's something that runs through all of your books, but it really evokes for me an aspect of your book, Shivani, which is that there are, you know, this idea of motherhood, um, which comes up in many different ways. There, there are women who um, are unable to be mothers. There are women who choose not to be mothers. There are, there are women who were mothers but are no longer mothers, perhaps because their child has died. But for them, being a mother is still very much a part of who they are, and it's still how they communicate with uh, the people who are no longer there, but still mean a lot to them. And so I was just wondering, um, like, what do you think mothering can mean when there is no one to mother? I am not a mother yet, as far as I know. <laughs> um, but it, it's something I think about a great deal. I used to say that by the time I was 30, which was some time ago now, I would have either a book or a child. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wonder if it was the right choice. It's always choosing, I think, when it's a woman-identified person who wants to womb this child in themselves and gestate them and spit them out and begin the business of loving them for the rest of your life. And I think like many women and non-binary people must have this struggle with themselves against the tyranny of biology, which limits your choices, and also the ways in which motherhood, to me, seems like it would be absolute. I can't imagine a thing above it, um, not even a marriage. And there, there are ways in which, as the eldest, eldest daughter club, I know you're out there, eldest <laughs> daughter syndrome, 
I know who you are. We, we know who we are. There's a way you feel responsible to care and nurture, even if you're not particularly maternal, whatever that means. So I've, I've tried to care for the poems more than I care for myself, um, which has been a really humbling practice. So whatever they've needed to say, um, the most secret and abject things, I've tried to let them say it and to remove myself almost as their maker. And I hope that's a kind of mothering that is honest. Mm -hmm. In the work, yeah, wonderful. Um, I love what you said earlier on, that if not for the poem, what would never be spoken at mm -hmm. all? You know, definitely a call to, to action, I think, for every writer out there. Um, yeah, I love that. And um, there's also this question of, when we look at like, things like absence, there's also a question of like, grief. Um, what is something that you, or for all of you, um, that, what is something about grief that you think is perhaps not talked about enough? Or what is something that you discovered whilst writing the book? <laughs> or what is something that perhaps, you know, struck you as you were talking about it or moved you? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question. Yeah, that is a question. It's interesting. To think about it. Um, I don't know. I, it is a very tough question because that's exactly what I struggled with in, in this book. Um, there was a chapter where I'm, this character is trying to explain grief, but it doesn't go well because it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense to her. It's just all over the place. And I remember myself trying to describe it, but it doesn't... It, you can only understand it once you've been through it. Mm -hmm. It's like a kind of like an inside joke and unless mm -hmm. you were there like you won't really understand you won't get it so mm -hmm. that's just, that's the best way I can explain grief is you have to have been there no I think that's a great it's explanation. A feeling yeah 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 I've never been through it so maybe it's a I'm, I'm, I'm kind of morbidly curious I don't know <laughs> yeah. yeah okay wonderful um, and one other thing, there's, there's a lot of like totems throughout your books, um, things being inherited, things being passed down. So in Anthony, you've got the father's rings in the poem Rings. Um, Shivani, you have the, the lecture of dead gold with the, the grandmother's gold. And in Sophie, there's this diary that um, Sangeeta keeps, which, you know, records, which kind of is like an almanac of the, the family's, um, the major events in the family's life, but it seems to just be about a garden. And so I was just wondering, like, what, were there any other objects that, as you were writing the book, that kind of helped you to write it or inspired you at some point? I can answer. Yeah. For me, it was, it was photographs. Mm. Simply photographs, because uh, I, you know, in putting the book together, I used a lot of there's photographs in the book, and um, a lot, most of them, I, all of them, in fact, I took. Uh, of my father throughout the years, no, actually not all of them, there's a couple of passport pictures that I didn't take. Um, but photographs are really interesting because uh, they're like time machines, so not only do they fix you, they fix the subject in space and time, you know, they fix something, but they also, when you look at them, they can transport you back to that time, so you're operating on two different levels, you're, oper you're looking at the photo, remembering a particular time in the context of where you are now. Uh, so I think that's interesting, and also the, the power of photographs to transmit information into the future. So they're operating on all these levels, the past, the present, and the future. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting, uh, and the photographs, yeah, were important to me. A lot of the photographs are on digital, they're like photographs I took with my phone, which uh, makes you question the idea of permanence as well, because, you know, if I lose the file, I lose the pictures, and they're like these, what are they, like zeros, and, a series of zeros and ones, you know? Okay. Some of them are physical, uh, but not many. Most of them are digital photos, and that, that's an interesting, how do you interact with a digital image as well? That's, that's, that's interesting. But yeah, it was photographs mm. and rings. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and with Shivani, like with your collection, there's a lot that could be said about um, 
you have the poem All the Dead, All the Living, which is such a great um, carnival poem, which I just love. And there's a question of masquerade um, that kind of runs through. There are places where people dress up and, and uh, use alter egos and drag and, and to express themselves. Um, and so, you know, I was just um, wondering, like, what that, how that had helped you to think about um, and I, I suppose also transformation, like there's the poem, um, I see Lilith have been with thee again, um, where the daughter, you know, literally transforms. And so how did you think about transformation, all kinds of transformation, um, as a way of thinking about characterization and family and being a daughter and being a mother? I think there's a, again, a palatable Caribbean that we are often taught through colonial means to digest and understand as acceptable, and we understand our place in it as functional citizens who work and earn wages and take care of their families and go to church or temple or mosque. There is always this active subterranean need for more than that, or that, but things that hold that in a cradle and then are free to be so much wilder, so much more transgressive, so much more subversive. I actually don't think I'm more any of those things than anyone else. I just think we all learn how to punish ourselves mercilessly with shame, and so we don't get access to those stunted growths in our body. And so haunting became about a place where people converge, or diverge, or but verge, to, to find meaning with each other in queer community, in the community of women who have accessed abortions and the community of people who cross-dress and transgress because none of these things are not ever Caribbean and none of these things don't have to do with family and how we, how we make ourselves and shape ourselves and are there for each other in blood and, and out of it. Mm. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Could we have a reading from you? The, one of the first things I started writing about was abortion. Abortion remains illegal in Trinidad, which is to say where it is illegal in any place, it simply means that not that there are no abortions, only there, that there are no safe ones. Um, women and people who carry children have needed to find ways to not since the beginning of time. And and I write about a family of abortionists, which is not my immediate family. My grandmothers and mother would like you to know. Who, <laughs> who would, I feel like parallel to this book, I need to do a book, a pamphlet of disclaimers from my mom and grandmother. Like, this is not us, this is not us. Dear God, this is not us. So this family of abortionists, abortionist women do carry out this difficult work and it's, I cared writing about it very much. This poem is now more than 10 years old. And I realize now it was a conduit into beginning to write about dangerous things that were very, very close to me. The abortionist daughter declares her love. Hair is the church. These are the doors that open to the sea. My grandmother once knelt here, awed, a special guest to an exorcism. It is nothing like the movies would have you think, she told me, and I believed her. They have called me many things between these aisles, she told me, and I believed her. That is the trouble with our trade, she said. When men aspire to terrible jobs, we offer them hushed respect, the blushing necks of virgins, women wearing the same gloves, sorting the same straight-backed pins between the prayers of their teeth, are taught to deserve nothing more than an acreage of sorrow. Why an acreage? Never give a woman more sadness than she needs. From this fabric, from this persistent earth, she will wrangle greater things than men can fathom. She will wrestle squalling tar infants from the mire 
and those children shall stumble upwards, slicing through the spines of men who have offended their mothers. Give a woman an acreage of humiliation with one spade, one crucifix, one box of straight-backed pins. You've given her nothing she can hold. Within the year, she will run up hard against the borders of her land, shrieking, scouring the air for a way to flee her sex. Give her enough land to hang herself. Here is the church. It lies close to the land that they gave us. Come see the land of my grandmother and her mother and hers. Come walk on the borders of my mother's land, where no trees grow. Thank you so much, Shivani. Um, I love that so much of your book is about women reclaiming their power and creating it for themselves. And um, I just wonder for you, how do you feel more powerful having written the book? And what do you think power means? Ooh, that's a dangerous question to ask me. Um, the, the legal answer to that is that I think power has increasingly meant accepting that I will probably be afraid in almost any given situation, but learning that there's great strength in being terrified I've been here um, for about two months now, and what I forgot about being in this country is the, all the ways in which it seemingly innocuously, but really insidiously, almost in this serpentine way, conspires to make you feel small in your body as a, a, a black or person of color, a person from the global south. And I have, it's been an active process of reclaiming my space, my breath, the, the room I take up on the underground, the way in which I refuse to let random white men on the street brush past me and push me into whatever the hell they want to push you into, it doesn't matter, it could be like a baby and they would do it and, and continue walking. And how to ins try to insist for myself in the ways that I've always tried to make my poems insist for themselves. Again, this idea that we were talking about of how to mother things that aren't children and if I am an advocate of care. I have to try to care about myself. And that's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm um, going to do a very sharp segue. Um, and I think just like to, to close, I would love to know, thank you so much. That's a really wonderful answer. You know, it's really wonderful. Um, and I'm just wondering well, like, what the lasting impact of the book is for each of you in general. Like uh, we're talking about mothers, daughters, fathers, sons. So like what has writing your book taught you about being a son or being a daughter? Yeah, I, I mean, there's some guilt that came around a couple times <laughs> uh, when I was writing this book, which made, that was the very terrifying part, um, one of the very terrifying parts. But I, I did come to understand that um, having your own voice, does it make you a bad daughter? Mm. Um, writing is most definitely the most rebellious thing I've ever done, um, but it's the best thing I've ever done as well. Um, but in a nutshell, it doesn't make you a bad daughter. It makes you your own person, I think. Mm. Wonderful. Which of the daughters do you most relate to in your book? Which of the daughters? I would say Cassandra. Yeah. That's who I resonate with the most. Yeah. Mm. You're a bit of a peacemaker, mediator, middle child? I'm the eldest daughter. You're the eldest, <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, pretty quiet, but. Eldest daughter's club, yeah. Sorry? Eldest daughter's club. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, uh, yeah I'd, I'd say probably the peacemaker, mm -hmm. probably. Wonderful, yeah. Anthony? Um, oh, wow, what I, what I learned was that I was very different to my father. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, you know, realized, well, my dad wasn't a great father in any way. My dad had probably about 12 children. Um, actually, we're not sure. It's about 12. He had a lot of kids, uh, and he wasn't a father to any of them. 
in the sense of a, a father that's there and present in their lives. Um, and I've been asked, you know, how you can, why would you write a book about a man like that? You know, how can you write so much poems about this man that was a really terrible father? Um, and what the book has taught me is that it's possible to love someone, even if they are, you know, questionable, if they do questionable things or, you know, it's possible, it's about the capacity to love, I think. That's the sort of thing that I get from this, that it's possible to love someone even like my dad, mm. you know. Mm. Um, mm. That's it, that's what it's taught me. Yeah. yeah, and there's this inextricable thing about, you know, the fact that a father, regardless of how they behave, same thing with a mother, yeah. they're the one who brought you into the world. Yeah, but with my dad, it's not just that. It's not just that he was, you know, he gave, he donated some sperm. It's, it's not just that. It's that he, as a person, mm. he was a lovable person. Mm. When you were with him, he was very charismatic and, you know, a very loving, a very lovable person. So it was hard not to like him. You know, it was hard not to fall in love with him. He's very charismatic, charming. Um, so yeah, that had an, that that had a, a, a something to do with it as well. The fact that I still I still have good feelings about him, even though you know he wasn't around. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, Shivani. I think what everyone knows I'm a haunting taught me about being a daughter is that even if you are the most difficult. Um, according to yourself, unlovable, um, troubled, rebellious person in your family, then you're, you're still a part of that family. And there's nothing anywhere that says that you need to understand or be understood perfectly by anyone in your family to, to love them. And that, I think it took a while post-haunting to understand this part um, specifically, which was that Making these poems, which felt like an act of great defiance and subversion, was also simply me being true to who I was, and that my parents and my brothers, specifically them, my extended family, uh, you, you kind of get like a little murky past there. But again, I don't care, because I have that nucleus of, of what feels like unconditional love, which is probably a falsehood, but within that space that we make for each other, we are able to say, I love you as you are, even though you will probably continue to confound me in some ways, and I am always here for you, mm -hmm. hopefully even after death. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful messages. Thank you. I would so love to hear each of you read for another minute or so. Um, Anthony, can we start with you? Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, I'll try to be quick. Many years ago, I was at a, at a, a conference in, in Washington at Howard University, um, and this poem is set there. It was probably the first time that I began to think about my dad in relation to his absence and my becoming a poet, uh, and I wondered if there was a connection between those things. So this is Breakfast in D.C. That night, after the conference in D.C., we broke free of post-colonial tautology to gather in the small room of the writer in residence. We were young scholars, poets, novelists, a journalist. We drank white wine warm and nodded to Neo Soul. I saw them recoil from the British resident when in the marrow dark of 3 a.m. he rightly said that there was nothing like the sweet kick of crack cocaine. At dawn, we drove out in the doctoral candidate's car. We saw the Doric pillars of the Lincoln Memorial glowing in the unclear distance. Then the white gasp of the monument. We ordered pancakes with blueberries at Pete's on 2nd Street and shared our commonalities. And what we shared, besides our blackness, was that in our childhoods, our fathers had all been absent. Mm. Sophie? With the safe distance between them all, the years went by. Six, six years after my cousin and aunt died, 
I was born right there in the Macaria where it all happened. And despite the sorrowful womb that nursed my sister into this world, she was a jubilant and gorgeous child. The little planets that we were, sucked into the vortex of everything before, we fell into place in our positions as the good daughters, the subservient daughters, the domestic daughters, the unopinionated ask no questions daughters, the completely normal everything is fine falling apart on the inside daughters, circling, circling what? Who was at the center of this force? What was both pulling us in and passing through us? What was its name? Why couldn't we break free? It was the past. The Lecture of Dead Gold. When my grandmother died, we melted the gold she never wore in life. We unearthed the Priyas and Khan's boxes like confection houses of the dead, prizing loose bangles and arm snakes, shaking out the hutch hoard of dowries, taking inventory of a thousand joys. Wear them for love, Mama says, sinking thick posts into cartilage. My brother wears the earrings and kisses his man roll. He calls it Gethsemane on the priority bus route after midnight, sucks olive oil out the red stripe of Khaled's mouth. I wear the earrings three evenings before Diwali. They are too heavy, too holy, an all soul slap to the jaw, dealt, slant, and sharp, like the first time my grandmother cut my cheek with her love. The hooks draw blood, digging for Sunday drives, trawling for breast milk, pushing argentum through sore flesh till memory sings, till I quit the graveyard at Freeport, airs stretched and bleeding out. Thank you so much. Um, it's been so wonderful talking to all three of you, and um, thank you to everyone for coming. And um, we could talk for so much longer, but I think for now we'll just have to say goodbye and yeah, um, have a lovely evening and have a lovely event. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you.